Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining today's edition of Taneo Insights. I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York City. The topic of our call today is China following the 20th Party Congress that recently wrapped up, uh, which really was more than anything else, the Xi Jinping show. And while he has now taken an, uh, a sort of unprecedented in the post Deng Xiaoping era, uh, era third term as the chairman of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, that was no surprise. What was perhaps a little bit more surprising or what China watchers were considering the most was the composition of the Politburo and the Politburo Standing Committee and the others who were going to be uh, comprising that ultimate leadership of, of, of China and whether there would be even the pretense of um, checks and balances on Xi Jinping. All of that has now gone by the, uh, by the wayside. So I'm joined today uh, by my guests who are going to talk a little bit about what the implications are and their interpretations uh, of the events of Xi Jinping's speech and of the Congress's working, uh, working paper. So I'm joined uh, today by a number of colleagues who will be familiar to you. Uh, Yun Sun is back with us today. She's a senior fellow and the co-director of the East Asia Program and the director of the China Program at the Stimson Center in Washington, D.C. Formerly, she was with Brookings and the International Crisis Group. Yun, welcome back. Paul Hanley joins from Singapore today. He is the chairman of the Asia Pacific region for Taneo. Uh, he is also a visiting senior research fellow at the East Asia Institute uh, at National University of Singapore. Um, he's an adjunct professor at Tsinghua University, and he holds the Morris R. Greenberg Director's Chair at Carnegie China. Um, he was the China Director at the National Security Council at the White House uh, for President George W. Bush and President Obama. And Gabe Wildow, he's a managing director here at Taneo, and he leads our coverage of China from the United States. Uh, he spent 14 years living in China, most recently as the Shanghai Bureau Chief uh, of the Financial Times and formerly was with Reuters and Gavacal Dra Dragonomics. So um, thanks, everybody, for joining today. And I want to just sort of kick it off by starting by asking each of you, you know, your first read of, uh, of what transpired at the Party Congress, um, what surprised you? Um, and what your key takeaways are. And then we'll sort of go into a deeper conversation and unpack a lot of that. But Yun, maybe we can start start with you and your, your key takeaways. Sure, thank you, Kevin. Well, the funny thing is, everyone that I have talked to in China and outside China since the, uh, since the Party Congress, everyone is surprised by the composition of the new Politburo and Politburo Standing Committee. Don't get me wrong, it's not that people did not expect Xi to prevail. Everybody did expect him to prevail. But instead, it is a fact that she took all when he does not need to that shocked people. Giving one or two seats to the so-called reformers is not going to have any significant impact over the policy he wants to pursue. Just recall how neither Li Keqiang nor Wang Yang was able to influence the zero COVID policy for more economic pragmatism in the past two years. Then to take all the seats without leaving anything to the other camp just looks terrible for the political optics. So, and, and I want to ask one thing before I move on to Paul and, and Gabe, if I could just follow up with you, if I could. You know, we, I think it's been very clear what the American media take and, uh, and, and, and especially the political take in Washington has, has been to this. But to this point that you've just made, that what was surprising was how he essentially cleared even the optics of any opposition or any check of balance um, uh, off the table. Do you have a sense of what the Chinese reaction to all of this is. I mean, and when I say the Chinese, I'm not talking about the elites in Beijing and, and, the, other, and the other major political centers, but rather this sort of the proverbial man on the street. I mean, I know it's <clears throat> challenging given censorship and uh, the restrictions put on uh, social media and the like during this time, but do you, do you get a sense that it was just sort of inevitable and now let's carry on with our lives or is there a sense of surprise amongst the, um, uh, the population as well? There is a sense of inevitability that with Xi Jinping's prevalence in the past 10 years, everybody expected him, him to have a third term. But I think what people had not realized before the Party Congress in terms of the impact of Xi Jinping's um, decisions this time around is that it really affects how people think and it really affects how people will act down the road. Like, for example, in the past, the people might still have some disagreement, like, oh, this, is, this policy, I do not agree. But now Xi Jinping is basically claiming that I will be here indefinitely 
So anyone who does not come on board with this policy or with my policy, you better not be not be in my government or not be working inside the uh, the government apparatus or opposing she is not the smart thing to do. So I think that is going to create a social atmosphere in the Chinese society that she is not to be challenged and his policy will have to be implemented to the 120 degrees. In fact, this point has already come out in at least two uh, private dialogues that I hosted last week since the end of the party Congress, that you can see people thinking visibly has changed. Another thing that has changed is, uh, well, what we can observe are the Chinese students who are currently studying in the United States, right? For the number of Chinese students that I have talked to, asking that, well, do you plan to go back to China? Do you, what do you think about the party Congress? I would say the overwhelming majority of them are expressing the desire to stay, that there's no point going back to China anymore, that if we get the opportunity to stay in the United States, we will. So I think that's another uh, glimpse of how average people feel about the result of the party Congress. Paul, I'd like to hear your takeaways. Now, we've spoken about this quite a bit in, in recent weeks, but uh, but building on what Yun was just talking about, um, you know, what were your key key takeaways and, and, and any surprises that you had? Oh, thanks, Kevin. And I and I agree with uh, what Yun said, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, in terms of surprises, what was interesting to me was, you know, this the party congress was about a week long. Um, at the beginning of the week, there were really no surprises. We had President Xi's speech. We had the work report that was released. And the big takeaway was one of continuity. No surprises, really. A kind of steady-as-she-goes approach by the leadership, both in terms of economic policy and foreign policy, diplomacy. I didn't get the sense, uh, for example, that the foreign business community was rattled by anything that President Xi said or anything in the work report itself. At the end of the week, we learned the makeup of the new Central Committee, uh, the Politburo, and the Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, and here there were really, I think, quite a few surprises. And Yun, Yun has already you know, talked to this. But for me, a key question going in to the 20th Party Congress was whether or not the personnel selections would reflect an attempt to balance Xi Jinping's power, or was he going to you know, sort of run the table? And it was very clear. Uh, on Sunday, uh, that he completely ran the table. It was a clean sweep. And I think some of it, in my view, look, I'm not a Marxist-Leninist, but it just seemed unnecessary, as Yoon was suggesting. Uh, he decimated the China Youth League. Um, and just to give some examples of how he did that, um, in the standing committee, Wang Yang and Li Keqiang were both young enough to stay on, but he pulled them both out. Uh, they were both 67, and according to the previous, you know, age norms, they could have stayed on. The other one, which was really surprising, I think the most surprising, frankly, was Hu Chunhua. Uh, he's a protege of Hu Jintao, China Youth League. He was speculated to be in the running, to be elevated to the standing committee. He's in the, he was in the Politburo, and maybe to serve as premier. He'd been vice premier. He had, had economic experience. And as Yun said, it would give him you know, would give President Xi the optics or the illusion, frankly, that there was a balance of power, somebody to challenge him, but virtually he's not going to challenge him. Um, not only was he not elevated to the standing committee, he was demoted and taken out of the Politburo. That was one of the biggest surprises. Uh, first time in 25 years, no women. Um, and then we can talk about this later, but the selection of Li Chang um, as the next premier was quite, I think, quite surprising. So in sum, she ran the table, clean sweep, all political allies, loyal to Xi, which is the most important factor, no policy or technical experience. And so I think that's when the concerns kind of emerged from, you know, people in China, but also kind of the international community and the, and the foreign business community. Can I just, I want to follow up on one thing that, that Yun said a moment ago when she was mentioning that um, it's spoken to to students who are who are based, Chinese students based here in the United States and this sort of, uh, um, you know, uh, feeling coming out of this, there's no reason to go back um, in a sense. We have also seen, however, uh, in recent years, that there's been pressure against Chinese scholars in the United States there, that have been looked at with some degree of, uh, of suspicion that they are effectively a Trojan horse for Chinese intelligence and uh, 
uh, and attempt. So, you know, um, and I've, I've always felt, you know, particularly in sort of the critical technologies area and uh, critical sciences and research areas, um, you know, when people are getting advanced degrees in there from various countries, we ought to just sort of staple a green card onto that. We need these, uh, we need this kind of expertise in this country if we're going to remain competitive. But there's there, is there, is, is this cadre of people going to get caught in the geopolitics between China and, and, and the United States? They don't want to go back because of the lack of uh, academic freedoms, perhaps, that they would have here. Uh, but then there's pressure on them here in the United States as well. What's your read on that? No, I think that's exactly right. Um, you know, as Yun said, uh, some of the students watching, you know, what happened at the 20th Party Congress, what's going on with zero COVID, I mean, that policy, um, you know, is not uh, not liked by anybody uh, in China. Um, the economy's not doing well. They've got some significant headwinds in front of them. But at the same time, I think they're feeling as though the environment in the United States is not as friendly. Uh, and supportive to them as well. Um, and so, yeah, in a sense, they're they're caught in between. Um, you know, as to your question to, to Yun about, you know, how do Chinese people see the conclusion of the 20th Party Congress, I think they're quite surprised. It may, you know, remind the older generation of, of a previous era, maybe under Mao Zedong, um, more singular control at the top. Um, but we do have to acknowledge that, you know, up until this point, President Xi has enjoyed very strong political support in China. You know, if President Biden had this, the popular support. If President Biden had the kind of popular support that President Xi has, he'd be delighted. But, um, you know, so I, I, my, my guess is that they will give the new leadership some time to see what happens. They may not like what they see, but they don't frankly have much of a choice in China. Uh, and in this regard, I think it'll be important to see what happens with some of those policies I mentioned, zero COVID, you know, what happens with the economy, the property sector, some of the challenges that directly impact the well-being of Chinese people. And the question here is whether growing frustration over COVID controls, lockdowns, challenges in the real estate sector, a slowing economy, will at some point begin to threaten or undermine the strong popular support we've seen to this point uh, for President Xi? You know, there are no, there are seemingly no factions now um, or rivals to Xi's power. So if things go well, that's good for Xi. But what happens when things don't go well for Xi? Uh, previously, if there were problems, uh, President Xi could, could blame others like Li Keqiang. Uh, but now he's got to deliver across the board. And frankly, the, the buck start, both starts and stops uh, with him. Okay, so you've just laid out a number of issues that I want to unpack over the course of our conversation here, but I want to bring Gabe in here and just go back to that original question, Gabe, and your your sort of, uh, you know, your initial takes um, as it was all unfolding um, over the last couple of weeks. Thanks, Kevin. So you and Paul covered the main points in terms of surprises. I would just add that uh, the choice of Lee Chung is surprising for the reasons they mentioned and also because among the other norms that were broken, is that Li has never served as vice premier. So his ascension or his presumed ascension to premier is surprising. And what that speaks to is that he doesn't have as much experience in Beijing um, as, as you would expect from someone who had served as vice premier. And, and so that reinforces the perception that he will not be able to influence policy very much because he lacks experience and connections and influence in Beijing as opposed to having served in the provinces. And uh, so it reinforces the power that, that the, the sense that he's he's just a figurehead. Uh, relatedly, I guess, and we'll talk more. I, I think uh, in this call about uh, about economic policy, but uh, there was a lot of continuity in the work report uh, in terms of repeating phrases and slogans and, and commitments that we've we've seen before. But uh, continuity was not what markets were looking for, certainly. Um, because the, the work report and the party congress in general did very little to reassure on the economy at a time when both domestically and abroad people are very nervous about the economy. And there was no attempt to reassure observers that the economic growth, I mean, some of the slogans uh, about development being the top priority that are familiar remained present, but there was a strong um, countervailing emphasis on security. and. Um, that's not what markets were looking for. Even ahead of the party congress, there had been 
uh, a perception that the leadership is complacent about slowing economic growth. And they might have taken this party Congress opportunity to try to dispel that impression. But if anything, that impression of complacency and uh, a degree of indifference about slowing growth, uh, especially in the in the property sector, um, was reinforced. And so uh, that was surprising to me. So let's just let's talk a little bit more about Lee Chung for a second, because I think many people um, in our audience perhaps are are less familiar with these constituents of the of the standing committee. So let's talk about him for for a moment. You um, have made the point that he uh, has has not been a vice premier um, and his professional experience has been outside of Beijing. He is the party secretary of Shanghai, obviously one of the economic powerhouses of the uh, and, and therefore political powerhouses of the of the country. On the other hand, he it, it seemed to me that it was a little bit of a surprise that he became the number two on the standing committee, given how poorly received and seemingly poorly handled the, uh, the, the COVID lockdowns in Shanghai have been over the earlier parts of this um, of this year. Having said that, and while he's seen as a Xi Jinping loyalist, it should also be noted that he handled the, um, the agreements with Tesla to build the giant factory in, in Shanghai uh, and has been seen as a political patron um, of Jack Ma and, uh, and Alibaba. In other words, an advocate of some private, you know, of, of critical private industry as well. So give us a little bit more, Gabe, on your take on, on, on Lee Chung and, and what it even means to be the number two on a standing committee that's actually led by Xi Jinping. Right, so I mean, one of the big questions for China watchers has always been uh, in regards to this, this question of factions and, and what factions mean and, and how they break down. So I, I think it's clear that Li Chang is a, is, a, um, is a Xi Jinping loyalist, but uh, that doesn't necessarily mean ideological or policy uh, full policy alignment or coherence with Xi's policy preference and Li's policy preference, because it's a kind of patronage-based faction or a loyalty-based faction rather than ideology or policy-based faction. And so there is a case to be made that, that Li Chang is not a reformer, but someone who cares more about economic growth, who's more sympathetic to the high-tech economy or to the consumer high-tech economy, uh, of which Alibaba and Tencent are the, the biggest representatives. And you mentioned his his record there. Uh, he was also uh, uh, important in setting up the the new um, tech focused stock board in Shanghai, the so called Star Market, Shanghai and Technology Market, which was a, a new capital market, uh, a new part of the Shanghai Stock Exchange, specifically devoted to fostering uh, high tech startups and and um, advanced manufacturing startups. And so. Um, if you wanted to be optimistic about uh, the party's continuing emphasis on growth, you, you, could, you could point to those things. You could also point to the fact that he appeared to care a lot about growth um, as leader of, of one of China's most important cities. Um, the question, though, is, uh, as I alluded to earlier, whether that matters, whether his preferences will matter, even if he is pro-growth, whether uh, if he's just a figurehead for Xi, perhaps his pro-growth uh, preferences don't matter. Um, but uh, I, I think, you know, we'll see in the next few months, I think the, uh, you know, the, the National People's Congress in March will be the first big uh, test, whether they uh, establish a growth target, an annual growth target for 2023 there, um, or if they don't do that, that will be a, a very clear confirmation that, uh, that growth is, is sort of second priority now. Um, so I, I, I'm afraid I don't have strong predictions yet about Lee, but you could see, you could sort of see things going both ways. So Yun, just picking up on something that Gabe said, because this goes back to you and I were going back a little back and forth a little bit last night uh, ahead of today's uh, ahead of today's program um, on this concept of factionalism that Gabe was just uh, Gabe was just mentioning, and so much has been made of the complete uh, elimination of the uh, of, of the Communist Youth League as an example, seen as a little bit more. Uh, market oriented perhaps as a faction but but do you do you see factionalism actually and maybe at a more micro level uh, but already sort of uh, in place on the on the standing committee or within the Politburo itself that um, that may be not discernible to the to the layperson's eye like mine but to experts like yourselves you can see a little bit of that um, and or that these are the these are the potential fissures that you would watch closely Absolutely. Well, factionalism is almost an eternal theme 
in Chinese politics from dynasty to dynasty. So if anyone says, well, there's one dynasty, there, there's no factionalism in the, in the court, in the royal court, well, that is simply not true. So for Xi Jinping and his political loyalists, I think in the past 10 years, they were able to pre present a united front because they had a common agenda, which is to seize power from his predecessors, from both Jiang and from Hu and from the Communist Youth League and from the so-called reformists. So from that perspective, in the past 10 years, it has a luxury of having a united position. But we also know that within Xi's political, polit uh, political confidants and loyalists, there are different factions. There are, there, there are for example, those who, who call the Zhejiang Gan, the cadres that rose to power when Xi Jinping was a party secretary in Zhejiang. And there's also the Fujian Gan because Xi Jinping served quite a long tenure in Fujian province, and there were a good number of, uh, of officials that have followed him since then. There's also what they call the, the Shanxi Gan, because Xi Jinping's hometown is from the Shanxi province. And for example, when you look at the number two at the Central Military Commission, Zhang Youxia, he's very clearly a, um, what the Chinese will call Lao Xiang, from the same hometown as, uh, as, as Xi Jinping did. And there are also people, there's a group of senior cadres from the, um, from the University of Tsinghua, where Xi Jinping normally also went. So, um, and last but not least, there is also the defense complex gun that we see the, for example, the party secretary of the Xinjiang Autonomous Region, Ma Xinrei, he has a completely aviation defense complex background. So there are these different groups and people are already asking questions. So for example, why is Chen Wenqing, um, for example, uh, elevated to the head of the um the committee of well discipline committee and why is Wang Xiaohong the head of the minister uh, the minister of public security now receiving that uh that promotion and why is Cai Ti a core member of the Zhejiang Xin uh, Zhejiang Xinjun the, the Zhejiang Gan elevated into the political uh, the Politburo Central uh, Politburo Standing Committee and why are other people from the Fujian Gan not being selected for the, for the same position. So that is to say that Xi Jinping now has a whole plate, right? He has already claimed the whole cake, the whole pie. And now it is a time to, to divide the pie. And there are indeed different factions within his group will be competing for these key positions. And people will be asking the question, why is he getting the position? Why is the other guy not getting the position? So I think we're already seeing the rise of factionalism within the Xi Jinping group already. You know, Paul, um, a lot has been been made of these constituents of the uh, of the Standing Committee, and a lot of it meant about politics and economics and and the like. But you just mentioned um, the the new number two at the uh, on the military commission, and I do wonder about this because obviously, you know, coming out of Russia Ukraine, there was this narrative that you know um, what happened to Russia in in Ukraine would give Putin, uh, would give Xi Jinping pause about any military adventurism, particularly with regards to, to Taiwan, um, because China hadn't engaged in a war since 1979, uh, you know, the, the Russian military didn't perform up to expectations, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do we know about the people who are sort of at the top of the military leadership now in China? It, it occurs to me that these are some, um, th th these are people who've got uh, actually uh, quite strong credentials, um, you know, for military competence. But what's your, what's been your take on that? <clears throat> That's a great, great question. First, let me just say that um, on the Taiwan question, in terms of what we saw coming out of the, um, of the, of the 20th Party Congress, you know, President Xi reiterated China's preference for a peaceful resolution to the Taiwan issue, but also reiterated that China reserves the right to use force if necessary. So that's kind of standard fare. Um, we did see a bit of a greater emphasis on stressing China's opposition to foreign interference. Uh, this isn't necessarily a new position for China, uh, but I think because of Ukraine, which you mentioned, uh, because uh, Xi Jinping and Putin signed a, a no-limit strategic partnership less than three weeks before Russia invaded Ukraine, I think there's growing international attention to the Taiwan question. China recognizes that it doesn't like that. Uh, and so not only is it worried about the U.S. approach to Taiwan, it's worried about this growing international approach. Uh, 
And I suspect that this opposing foreign interference, we're going to be hearing more about it. It'll be potentially a more central part of what we hear from China on Taiwan. Now, the I think the big um, news coming out of the 20th Party Congress on Taiwan was, was what you said, which is the personnel selections. Um, and the military leadership in the Central Military Commission in particular, which I think send a clear signal that the PLA will have a strong focus on Taiwan over the next five years. Yun mentioned uh, General Zhang Yosha, 72 years old, so his promotion went against the previous party norms that required Central Committee members to retire before they turned 68. He's the first ranked vice chairman. Um, over the years, he's been very instrumental to military reforms launched by President Xi. His father and uh, President Xi's father fought together against nationalist, nationalist forces in the Chinese Civil War. Um, and I think by promoting uh, Je General Zhang, uh, Xi Jinping gets someone at the top of the Central Military Commission that he can trust, a loyalist. The second uh, ranked vice chairman on the Central Military Commission is a gentleman by the name of General He Weidong. And he's got a, a good deal of command experience in China's eastern military district, closer to, to Taiwan. Uh, he was based in Fujian, coming up uh, through the military. Later, he became the military commander of Jiangsu province, which was part of the previously part of the Nanjing military region that oversaw, you know, the, the Taiwan theater of operation. Three years ago, uh, he was put in command of the Eastern Theater Command, which has responsibility over Taiwan. So he, um, you know, obviously with his focus on Taiwan, he was also reportedly, interesting enough, the senior commander that planned the military exercises that Beijing staged uh, around Taiwan after the visit of the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi. So clearly, based uh, on the top two generals in the Central Military Commission, we can see a clear signal that the PLA is going to be focused on Taiwan over the next five years and probably beyond. Yeah, Abe, I, I, I want to come back to something that's sort of, it, it's sort of been in the background of what all of you have been, been talking about. Um, and that is this sort of clearing of the decks, particularly of the, uh, of the China Youth League faction on the, um, uh, on the, on the standing committee. Um, but in a way, I feel like we have been, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but it feels like this has been the Xi Jinping show for quite a while. I mean, I'm wondering if we're going to, A, expect any policy changes coming out of this because those groups have been um, sidelined. And I know that the Party Congress is not a policy forming um, event, but it is, you know, it, it, it clearly uh, gives us some an indication of the direction of travel. But I'm wondering, you know, it, do, would you expect any policy changes coming out of this, number one? And number two, then, why? Why do away with even the optics of, um, of of having some sort of checks and balances against you to the point that uh, one of you made, you know, when something goes wrong, now there's no, you know, Xi Jinping owns the problem, so to speak. Um, you know, uh, why, why just do away with it? Uh, why do away with it? Does that actually, does that connote strength or weakness in a sense? Gabe, what are your thoughts there? Those are tough questions. In terms of the policy change or policy implications, I mean, certainly if you look at the market reaction to the announcement of the new leadership lineup, the markets believe there are policy implications. That might be an overreaction because, as you say, it's not clear that even before this 20th Party, Cong 20 Party Congress that there were meaningful constraints on Xi's ability to impose his policy preferences on the, on the uh, ministries and, and the uh, bureaucracy. Um, I think uh, there was a perception, which again might have been over overblown before the Party Congress, that uh, figures like Li Keqiang, although he was a, a considered a weak premier, but he was still able to exert a degree of balance. And people perhaps overinterpreted uh, moments where he wasn't wearing a mask uh, at public events to mean that he was dissenting from the strict zero COVID policy, or uh, he seemed to be emphasizing economic growth more than she, who was emphasizing persisting with zero COVID. Um, I think on the regulation of the high-tech economy associated with Xi Jinping's uh, signature common prosperity campaign, there was a perception that, that Li and others were not on board with that uh, and that they were more supportive of the so-called platform economy of sort of the consumer, the big consumer tech platforms. And, and I think then the market reaction to the new leadership reflected a perception that 
that uh, it's now op it's it's again going to be open season on uh, reg in terms of a regulatory crackdown on these tech companies because there's no one who can prevent Xi from kind of indulging his what they view as his worst impulses towards overregulation and state interventionism. So that might be overblown uh, for the reasons you say because it's not clear he faced constraints even before. But I, I think there's at least an argument that that now um, that there's no one who can. Uh, who can kind of make the other make the countervailing case in favor of of economic growth? Um, in terms of the the why did he choose to run the table? I mean, <clears throat> Yoon is probably going to be able to speak to that better than I can. But I think it's easy for us to sit here and say that he was completely unchallenged before, and there was no reason to install his loyalists. But the I think the atmosphere at the uh, at the elite level in Chinese politics is one of paranoia and. Um, and where you see enemies everywhere, where uh, you assume that anyone who's not your staunch loyalist is, has got a knife in his in his in his belt that he's ready to draw and to thrust into your into your back. And so, uh, the more loyalists, the better. The, the, it's easy for us to say that uh, he was completely safe before, but quite possibly he didn't see it that way. Yeah, Yun, what's your what's your take on that? Is it as a Shakespearean as that? I think that's part of it, but there, there's also a psychological factor, which is that I think Xi Jinping has a firm conviction that the direction that he is pointing to for China is a correct one. So when there are people who disagree with him, he does not necessarily challenge the wisdom of his own policy. He believes that these people are political enemies or political op oppositions that are standing in the way to the rejuvenation of the great Chinese nation. So I think that conviction really lays the foundation for this decision to clean the plate, to take it off. Because otherwise, I think it will leave hope for people who disagree with his policy if there are still identifiable um, representatives from the other political camp on the top level. It will leave hope for the bureaucracy within the society that, well, there, there is still the voices that we can look to or we can follow and potentially we can use to challenge Xi Jinping's policy down the road. So I think looking into the future, if you look at the decision that he decided not to have, for example, an heir apparent in the Politburo, Politburo Standing Committee, which is also arguably another violation of the uh, of the Chinese political tradition established since, uh, since Deng and Jiang, then you can visibly see that Xi Jinping is trying not to leave any hope or un leave any opening for his political oppositions, for people who do not agree his with his policy to believe that there is going to be a future time and a future chance that they can make a comeback. So by taking it all, Xi Jinping is eliminating those options and those possibilities. Paul, did you want to step in there? I did. Um, I agree with all of that, but I want to share also a narrative that I've heard here in Asia from voices more sympathetic, I think, to China. I put it in the category of no matter what China does, there's a way to blame the United States. But nevertheless, um, what I hear often from very sympathetic voices to China on why Xi Jinping uh, ran the table, why didn't he even you know, put people in who you know, I, I, what I said before the party congress is he would be very smart, but Hu Chunhua is the premier. Chinese Youth League, he's pretty, I mean, he's he's not that strong. Um, he would be no no resistance to Xi Jinping whatsoever, you know, in a, in, a, in, a rea, in a real sense. But yet he would have, you know, somebody to blame if things went bad. Plus he would give the impression that he's willing to balance power, but he didn't do that. And what people say here is it has a lot to do with the strategic pressure that he is feeling from the United States and the geopolitical environment, which is intensifying. Um, and we and you could read some of this uh, in the work report where, where it talked about the international environment becoming more hostile. Um, President Xi, I think, said in his speech, uh, you know, external attempts to suppress and contain China, that China needs to be mindful of potential dangers, be ready to withstand high winds, choppy waters, and dangerous storms. So there's a strong emphasis, much more on security this time. And if you look, for example, you do word counts, uh, the, the, the word Anquan, security, appeared in the work report. I think it doubled since the 18th Party Congress. Um, and so there was a, a stronger emphasis on that. And some 
people I've heard some analysis analysts here in Asia will say that because he feels in a sense the these great pressures and risks he needs a much more unified command structure um, and he needs to make sure that he has no resistance uh, whatsoever and so when you look at the people that he brought into the standing committee it, what's more what's more interesting than the fact they're not China Youth League they are you know all but one are protégés not just allies but protégés that is to say you know three of the four uh, new ones served either as chief chiefs of staff or as personal secretaries to president xi over the year which means that you know he was responsible for promoting them along the way uh, doesn't mean they're necessarily not competent but we can certainly conclude that loyalty and trust were key factors uh, for president xi in elevating them um, and so he wants to surround himself with people who he can who he knows that he can count on during a time of great external risks to china so guys this this begs then the big question right i think which is that you know one of the hallmarks of autocratic regimes is the deterioration in the quality of policy making over time as they eliminate their uh, as these leaders eliminate their um their potential opposition um, and they get surrounded ever more by yes, that most you know most uh, obvious example recently on that is going to be Putin and his decisions um, with regards to Ukraine. But for a long time, it looked like China has really threaded that needle by this kind of post Deng Xiaoping, you know, sort of cycling of leadership every ten uh, every ten years, um, having the the hallmark of these of these factions being uh, represented. There was this sense that there was some consensual decision making, even if there was a even if there was a top leader, and now that is uh, now that's being done away with. So I'm wondering what you all think is going to be the quality of decision making from from here on out. I would also add, just picking up from what you just said, Paul, that if you look at American power over the years, it seems to me that America exercised its greatest power at times when presidents were not surrounded by aides and you know key you know key. Um, um, underlings in a sense, but we're actually surrounded by peers, peer level leaders at the State Department, Defense Department, uh, and, um, uh, and, and at Treasury and the like. Um, so, you know, I think the, the great example on China, right, is, is on the COVID response. In the early days of COVID, the fact that they were able to lock down that country with a billion more people than the United States has, and yet hold deaths to an absolute minimum looked pretty impressive. However, in the post mRNA vaccine era, that starts to look much more sort of dogmatic and um, you know, and not great either for economic growth, et cetera. So in this era where, um, you know, as you say, international pressures are rising on Xi Jinping and economic growth is more challenging, what do you think about the quality of decision-making with this new lineup of, of, of government? Paul, maybe we'll start with you and then move on to Gabe and, and Yun. Well, this is one of the most in interesting aspects that I find, Kevin, because, you know, uh, after it was pretty clear he ran the table and removed uh, any resistance to him, brought all his loyalists in, it was interesting because I would speak to, you know, American analysts and they would say, you know, wow, this is terrible uh, for China. Uh, this does not bode well for China's future. He, uh, President Xi has made major miscalculation here. He's uh, surrounded himself by uh, yes men, and I heard somebody say, and, and, and no yes women. Uh, and he's going to only get uh, the, you know, information that uh, people, that, that will please him. You know, he's not gonna be, be getting information um, you know, that would upset him or challenge his uh, policy direction. And so ultimately over the long term, this is gonna be bad for China. Um, uh, but then, um, you know, when I talk, you know, when I look at the, uh, you know, Xi Jinping and the senior leaders of the, of the uh, Communist Party, it seems that President Xi got exactly what he wanted. So I suspect he's feeling quite good about the outcome uh, of the Party Congress, um, and that, uh, you know, having the leadership lineup that he has uh, puts China in the best position to deal with the challenges in front of it and to achieve its goals, you know, over the long term. So ultimately, it comes down to really like a philosophical question of governance, right? And, you know, is, you know, governance better if you have competing views 
uh, if you have those in the system that are challenging you, if you have checks and balances, um, and I think most Americans would come down on the view of, yes, that, that's the system that will work. And otherwise, uh, the system, if you have somebody at the top, uh, the system will become brittle and eventually break. Um, but it seems that, you know, Chinese leaders are very happy where it came out. And many uh, Western analysts uh, say that the outcome is very bad for China's future. So only time will tell, I guess. So, Yuan, what's your what's your take on this question of uh, of 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 or expectations on your part in terms of quality of decision making, quality quality of policy making going forward? Well, this is a terrific question, Kevin, and I agree a lot with what Paul just said. Because who are we to judge? <clears throat> That we in the West, we have a we have an ideal coming to political system and political decision making, and we believe that according to our criteria, China's well, the outcome of the 20th Party Congress is terrible. But like Paul just said, that while well, she might have a completely different set of ideas and different evaluation, and I think eventually it depends on the goals we believe that China is trying to achieve, right? Because a lot of this assessment about China's poor decision making, this um, lack of economic pragmatism, is based on the assumption that China prioritizes economic growth over everything else. Well, we know that had been the case since Deng Xiaoping, that everything is centered on economic growth and every policy will serve economic growth of China. But under Xi, I don't think that assumption still stands. And for him, what is more important? Well, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. And what it essentially means is that economic growth is only one piece of that rejuvenation. There are many other pieces. There's regime survival, there's regime legitimacy, there's national security, there's external security, there's China's claims in the South China Sea, there's also the issue of Taiwan. So all those coming together make, to make the Xi Jinping's ultimate goal, which is rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So this idea that China would subject all other aspects of its decision making to the prioritization of economic growth is no longer there. So therefore, when we look at China's decision making, um, I would say that while the Chinese will believe that they have a different set of goals and their policy currently are devised are designed to serve those goals and those goals may not align what we believe should be China's goals. Gabe, your, your, your take on that? I agree uh, violently with, with what Yun just said. I think um, when we look at, uh, you know, when we talk about quality of decision making, we have to specify along what dimension. So uh, is it the sort of technocratic implementation uh, aimed at these high level objectives that is potentially uh, of low quality, or is it the objectives themselves that we simply disagree with? And so we, and so uh, you know, when we hear, for example, on on economic policy, the kinds of criticisms coming from the IMF and the World Bank, and they want China to, uh, you know, th their their focus is on maximizing economic growth. They want China to, for example, reform the state-owned enterprises to be more efficient, to act more like privately owned enterprises. And so, uh, if that's your goal, then then. Xi Jinping's decision making is poor. But if that's not your goal, if in fact you don't mind that state owned enterprises are relatively inefficient compared to private ones because they serve as valuable instruments of state policy and as, as ways to dole out political favors and, and to punish enemies and to maintain the authority of the state and to advance big objectives like technological self sufficiency that don't necessarily maximize GDP, but are important for security and sovereignty and independence, well, then the quality of decision making is high. Uh, so uh, I think it's it's easy to conflate sort of prescription and description when we're looking at at uh, the question like like the quality of decision making uh, because you know we we're looking at it through you know and another example would be the the common prosperity crackdown the regulatory crackdown on the tech companies uh, from an economic growth perspective that was a disaster I mean the private tutoring industry which was completely destroyed was a um, was an important source of growth and employment. Uh, but she has other objectives. He thinks that this private tutoring industry was predatory, that it was essentially a waste of time and resources, even if it added to GDP. When you're paying a tutor, that adds to GDP. But if you're not learning valuable lessons from the tutor, if you're just teaching the test and everyone is just competing to uh, just to, 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 to ram themselves through this keyhole of this uh, of this test, and you have 
um, uh, rich families able to pay more for, for test prep. All that adds to GDP, but does it, it enhance China's comprehensive national strength? If you're, another example just quickly, I mean, if you're pouring subsidies into the semiconductor industry, you're, you're you know, from a economic, from a pure economic growth perspective, you're wasting a lot of resources, you're misallocating investment. Um, but if you think it's, it's of vital importance that you wean yourself off reliance on foreign technology, well then, um, then the quality of decision making is high, even if you are going to, you accept the fact that you're wasting a lot of money or you're wasting some money on industrial policy, on subsidies, many of which will not yield good results, but you feel you have no other choice because from a national security perspective, you're under great pressure. And so, uh, yeah, the, I think the, the, the concerns about yes men, the concerns about him not hearing negative information are, uh, are, are valid, but there's also just a question of objectives. I mean, the, the zero COVID, you know, might be another example where you have competing priorities around saving lives, you have competing priorities around social stability and preserving social stability against what you expect would be a huge wave of, of you know, hospitals being overloaded as, as a huge wave of COVID patients enter the hospital. So, uh, yeah, is that poor, poor quality decision making or is it simply a, a different set of uh, values and objectives? Okay, we're going to come back to the semiconductor question here in a couple of minutes. But, but while you've got the floor, Gabe, I've got to ask you, and maybe this is a little bit of a digression, but I do think it's relevant. Um, you know, obviously, one of the hallmarks of, uh, of sort of autocratic political theater is the sort of robotic polish that comes from these uh, events. And there was one exception to that uh, during that week, of course, and that was the um, sort of unusual removal of the former president, Hu Jintao, uh, from the uh, Congress as he was sitting there next to President Xi. Um, and I know you have done an, an, a, a frame by frame forensic analysis of this, uh, not unlike people looking at the Zabruder film. So what, what, what's your takeaway from what happened with Hu Jintao and, and is it relevant in the context of everything we've been, we've been talking about? Yes, well, the first thing to say here is that no one really knows what happened. I don't know what happened and we're all engaged in a high degree of speculation, but my, my view tends towards thinking that, that, that this was not an orchestrated purge or an orchestrated humiliation of, of who by she. And I think when we look at this, you know, we can separate the analysis into sort of two, two, two forms of argument. One is just sort of, does this make sense in terms of she's objectives? Um, and then two is the kind of granular frame by frame look at the video to try to understand what exactly happened. So on the first level of analysis, I, I just don't think, it's out of character for both for who and for she. It's out of character for who if you believe that he was making some kind of un, unscripted objection or reacting in an unscripted way to perhaps what he saw in these documents about the composition of the new central committee. Even if he uh, had strong objections, it's very out of character for him to express those publicly. That's just not, he, he rose up through a system where, where publicly objecting to the party's decisions is absolute, is, is the, is the biggest of all taboos. And then for she, it's out of character in my view because his style is to operate behind the scenes and to, and to undermine his uh, opponents through subtle bureaucratic and political and ideological maneuvering rather than through, you know, public act, act, acts of humiliation. So, so that's the kind of high level uh, analysis. And then in terms of the video, what I see is, um, I, well, first of all, I see video evidence that separate from this incident, she uh, who has been ill, has looked confused at times, has had to be helped on and off uh, stage at various events. Uh, there's There are rumors that he may have Parkinson's and or uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, but those aren't confirmed, but there, there are rumors. And, um, and, you know, if you look at exactly what happened in the video, he, he does look a bit confused to me. The scuffling, the apparent scuffling over the contents of this file doesn't look to me like the main thing that's happening in that video. It looks like he, like who is grasping for those papers, not because he's not allowed to read their contents, because it doesn't really make sense that that protocol would involve placing files in front of she, I mean, in front of who that he was not allowed to read. That I don't, that's not my understanding of how things would operate there. Um, it looks like his scuffling and grasping for those papers was was a way of him kind of resisting the the uh, urgings of of his uh, the other leaders that he ought to leave rather than per se that he he must read those papers or that he's being denied access to those papers but they're gathering up those papers as a prelude to shuffling him out is my tentative interpretation of the video 
Um, I know Paul and Yoon may have different views, but that's my, again, tentative uh, view of, of probably what happened. But there's no question that regardless of the truth, you know, the optics of it are, are terrible for who and are humiliating for his faction. So, you know, it has an, imp regardless of what really happened, it has a political impact just uh, on, on that level. Paul? Um, I agree with Gabe. I don't, I don't know that we're ever really going to know what happened to Hu Jintao. Um, there's a lot of speculation. Um, and, you know, as he said, you know, you, and he's made a very good case that it was possibly related to his health and he just got disoriented. You know, I do have friends who, you know, who think this isn't innocent at all, that he, you know, was trying to show his resentment towards Xi, basically wiping clean the China Youth League that he worked his whole life on. I, I don't know. It, I, I, I could not tell. And I watched the video many, many times myself. But what I would say is that, in, in a sense, regardless of what happened uh, and the symbolism of Hu Jintao's removal uh, really uh, turned out to be quite striking in that what we've talked about, she did remove all the Chinese Youth League affiliation. He replaced them all with Xi's loyalists. And so it becomes a very symbolic act in that sense demonstrating that we've witnessed the end of any resistance to Xi's dominance, the end of the Deng Xiaoping era, which was characterized by reform and opening and by more collective style of leadership. We have to keep in mind Deng, that uh, Hu Jintao was the, the last leader that Deng Xiaoping anointed uh, to be China's leader. Um, and uh, after that, Xi Jinping took over. So really, it, it, in a sense, it doesn't really matter what happened in terms of the symbolism that it created. I just add to that. Um, well, I agree with Gabe. I don't think it was orchestrated for 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 a closing ceremony of a, of a party congress. Everything was very well rehearsed. So for them to have this planted in the in the plot, that's almost unthinkable. But I think Paul really has a great point about the symbolism here. The question first: Why is Hu Jintao on the stage? We well, there's a very well circulated rumors that Hu Jintao already has Alzheimer's. He does look confused from time to time. But the reason for Xi to put him on the stage in the first place is to show that at least one of his two predecessors are on the stage to support the result of the 20th Party Congress. So it raises the question that well, if you put him there, was it even if he had Alzheimer's, he was confused, he was opening the folder and reading the content as he should not have. Is it warranted to escort him off the stage? Was it really necessary? Or I agree with Gabe that it's it probably not orchestrated, but that's even more scary because she didn't even feel the need to show the courtesy of keeping him on the stage. Like, oh, he, he has done something he should not have. Let's just remove him from the stage. I think that is even more scary than the other uh, than the other scenario, which is well, this was orchestrated, because it really shows that she has zero tolerance and respect for his uh, for his predecessor. You know, Yun, I want to take the last few minutes that we've got here and turn our attention a little bit to the to the United States. And while you did a um, uh, I think you did us a favor by kind of describing that the that the makeup of the uh, of, of the government now and the leadership in the party is not quite as monolithic as perhaps it's caricatured to be. It, you know, we do see some direction of travel here. So I wonder, as you look at the U.S.-China relationship going forward, is the bigger variable, is the bigger sort of wild card American policymaking because of the di divergent. I mean, even though it seems like the one area where there's bipartisan uh, sort of agreement is to try to be as hawkish as possible on China, yet we know that there's a, a, a lot of differences um, in terms of what the practical approach would be. So, you know, one one thing that um, that happened in the run up to the Party Congress, of course, was um, an, an ever you know an even harsher um, approach on the semiconductor front by the um, by the U.S. and clearly sort of setting the table for further actions on other technologies that are going to be critical to the 21st century, like artificial intelligence and quantum computing um, and, and the like. But we haven't really seen yet a reaction from, from China on this one. But on this kind of question of, is, is the U.S. the bigger variable now? Um, and what do you think are the sort of the next shoes to drop um, on, on that that will you know, further this kind of long-term deterioration in relations between the U.S. and China? We look at the composition of the foreign policy team uh, coming out of the party congress it does, it does not really boost the confidence 
among the five foreign policy personnel, the leaders on the Central Committee, uh, I would say none of them really has a background working on North America. The only person who has been posted to North America is Ambassador Qinggang, who just served ambassador in Washington for one year and three months. And now he's called back and people don't expect him to come back to Washington. And we know that U.S. and China are engaged in this, uh, this discussion about whether there is going to be a leadership summit in, in Indonesia later, later this month. And to my knowledge, it is China trying to drag its feet and asking for concessions from the United States. Otherwise, without positive incentive, what's the point of meeting? We saw the conversations that Wang Yi had with Lavrov, which during which that he sung high praise for the leadership of Putin. And we also saw the Chinese ambassador at the UN criticizing, gee, it's a vehement criticism of the nuclear poster document that the US just released. I would say that looking forward, um, U.S.-China relationship is not going to get better because of this uh, because it's a party congress. And given all the reasons that we have discussed, the lack of different opinion, the, uh, the unity of the decision making and the unity of the policy implementation, we will see the further deterioration of this relationship. Gabe? Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you and I don't see anything to interrupt the downward momentum in the relationship. And uh, in terms of China's response to the latest rounds of tech controls, what I see is, I mean, I think we can draw a contrast with Taiwan, where China feels a very strong incentive to retaliate uh, in response to what they see as U.S. provocations uh, on the one hand. And then on the other hand, uh, on something like semiconductors, where they don't really have much of a card to play. Um, where any retaliation would make probably make the situation worse from their perspective in terms of scapegoating a U.S. tech company in response to the tech sanctions imposed by Washington would only um, would only uh, accelerate the trend toward decoupling that China wants to resist. On Taiwan, by contrast, they see these military exercises that they do in response to the Pelosi visit, for example, as a way of deterring further provocations as a way of demonstrating seriousness and their willingness potentially to go to war over Taiwan uh, if necessary. On, on uh, semiconductors, they want to hug the foreign business community even closer as a way to uh, cultivate them uh, as, a, as a political constituency within the West that is pushing against or trying to resist the trend for decoupling. I mean, there's nothing that China hawks in Washington would want more than for uh, China to retaliate against, let's say, Apple or Google um, or or Intel, so that it pushes them for you know it it, it creates a, a less of incentives for those companies to stay in China. It pushes them towards withdrawing. That's what the China hawks want is decoupling. So I think what China is focused on is this long-term effort to achieve self-sufficiency to reduce their reliance on China. That is the kind of retaliate I and mean, reduce their reliance on Western technology. That is the uh, the kind of retaliation or more like a response that, that they're focused on. So Paul, I'm gonna give you the last word here today, but I wanna pick up on, on what Gabe uh, sort of just, just talked about. As we, as we look at the rise of the China Hawks on, in both parties in, in, in Washington sort of dominating the, dominating the debate, is it fair to say that from China's perspective in many ways, corporate America is kind of their, their last best friend um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of representing in, in, in Washington, um, that they do want uh, to continue um, economic connection, they do want continued capital flows into, uh, into China and, and the like. And so um, that's, um, that's an important and nuanced relationship uh, beyond just the Beijing-Washington continuum. Well, <laughs> It's, it's been true over the years that the business community, you know, when I was in the Bush administration and Obama administration, the U.S. business community was the ballast of the U.S.-China relationship. Um, but a lot of that changed. And, you know, these semiconductor sanctions and export controls don't come out of nowhere. There's a history here. And, you know, we helped shepherd China in the WTO in 2001. But shortly after, we saw policies that came up that really alarmed the U.S., uh, starting with the, with the Obama administration, indigenous innovation programs, seven strategic industries, cataloging technologies uh, leading up to Made in China 2025, which was supported by subsidies, uh, 
discrimination of foreign firms, forced technology transfers, and large degree of cyber theft of intellectual property. And a number of administrations tried to deal with these issues and didn't get very far. And now you're seeing the responses. Um, and I think it's important. This didn't come out of, you know, it didn't come out of nowhere. Jake Sullivan and Kurt Campbell, I think in their foreign policy article before they took over, said that the U.S. needs to spend more time running faster itself as opposed to trying to slow China down. I think in this technology space, they're going to try to do both. It's going to get really uh, much worse in my sense. Uh, and it's, we've got a, I agree with you, and we've got a rocky road uh, ahead of us. But uh, there's a history to this, and we need to remember that. Right. Well, we have to leave it there. Obviously, these uh, these stories are going to continue to evolve. So we'll have you all back um, in the uh, in the near future as events warrant. But um, until then, I want to thank Yun Sun and Paul Hanley and Gabe Wildow for for joining and for their thoughts today, uh, as ever. And thank all of you for joining. Till next time, I'm Kevin Kajawara in New York. Have a great day. Thank you.